Okay, well, welcome everyone to this lecture. I actually haven't done one of these lectures in a long time. So today's topic is going to be King Marches. And I've, um, there's actually a really nice book that Yasser co-wrote. It was like Paths of Glory or something like that. And uh, there's a lot of examples of king marches of uh, different kinds. So both on the winning side and like how the king gets chased, um, and gets checkmated. So we're going to take a look at all of the, well, several examples of those. So I have I think five examples. So this is, I think, um, the most well-known position when it comes to king marches. So white to move. Um, I think some people should be familiar with this. And also, given the topic, uh, I think <laughs> uh, maybe it's um, it's a bit of a hint. Uh, king marches are actually quite. Uh, I I don't think I've ever done it in any of my games, at least not in a middle game. And uh, I had one game where I, I, it was a complicated game. I was like doing well, and I didn't win. And then when I was analyzing later, my coach at the time was like, "Oh, you know." It's, makes sense if you put your king on the other side of the board before you start attacking your opponent. Uh, so when it, when it comes to positions with king marches, a lot of it, uh, most, a lot of the time it includes having domination. So it's not like you start marching your king and then all of a sudden your king just gets checkmated in the middle of the board. Uh, so in this position, if we, and we will do this um, in every example we look at, when we look at a position, first we will start by doing a summary of the position and what's going on. So in this position, white is uh, completely dominating, uh, has full control of the d file. Uh, this f7 pawn is a huge target, so these rooks just cannot move at all. And um, the only reason knight g5 is not moving is because of this battery of the bishop and the queen. But these pieces also cannot move because the second this piece is moved, then knight g5 is coming and uh, it's just game over. So the question is like how to make progress for white because a move like g4 doesn't work out. There's queen f3. Uh, so at some point even with this kind of a dominant position white does have to find a way to win so white starts bringing the king. So there's a really nice path for the king to go to h6. When the king goes to h6 then it's just going to be game over. This king cannot stop because uh, rook f7. So in the game, black just kind of gave up. Or maybe didn't realize what uh, king h2 was until it was too late because once the king gets here, uh, the king just gets to h6. So bishop went to c8 and the king h6 is coming and there's nothing to do. So really dominant position. So if bishop uh, c8, king h6, okay, it's checkmate. So what white, um, sorry, what uh, black could have tried is bishop c8. And the problem for black in this position is because um, the position is just so bad that um, white doesn't even need this rook to win the game. So white actually can win the game with a move knight g5 and just giving up this rook. Now that the bishop, so it's, uh, it's nice to be flexible, right? So now that the bishop has moved away, uh, we have this knight g5 move. And I think this is something happens mentally with players. When in your mind you're like, okay, I cannot move this piece because of this reason, and then it just stays in your brain regardless of what happens to the position. Sometimes we don't really keep up with the changes in the position when we make too many assumptions. So bishop c8, but okay, also knight g5 is a very concrete move, so you cannot just play knight g5 and not calculate anything. So knight g5, so if, um, let's say, giving up this queen, then and it looks like... Uh, White has run out of pieces to attack with, which sometimes happens when we're attacking. We give up too many pieces. But uh, now white can just simply play g4. And the idea is if hg, then h5. So h6 is a threat. And if takes, then queen h6, and now mid is unstoppable. So because of this placement of these rooks, this king is in just a really bad position. And if they take bishop d7, which of course is more logical, then g4 again and um, same idea of taking on queen h6 and if takes then h5 again same idea and uh, the position is just completely lost 
Okay, so let's move on to other examples. So this other example that I'm going to show you uh, is also a really well-known one and more of a fun game rather than anything. This was a casual game, I believe, but uh, this is another well-known uh, king walk, but this time uh, the king is on the losing side. So this is by Lasker. So knight f3, f5. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the opening. It's not the main point of this uh, lecture. So bishop goes to g5, takes e4. I remember I used to play this touch positions as a kid. Um, my repertoire from my childhood <laughs> is not the greatest. I played the French and the Dutch and the Stonewall. So I really did terrible things to my light square bishop starting from my childhood. But I remember that it was kind of known that these lines are kind of annoying for uh, for, uh, for black because this allowing e4 early and this uh, structure, at least that's what I remember from my childhood, that this was not supposed to be good. Of course, modern engines might have their own opinions. So takes, takes, b6, knight goes to e5, the not so subtle threat. So castles, queen h5. So again, another not so subtle threat of taking on f6 and then um, checkmating on h7. So opening the path of this bishop. So, so here, black should take on e5, but uh, I can understand why this is a difficult move to play because the bishop on f6 looks like a defensive piece. So how can you give up one of the few defenders of your king? So black plays what looks like a logical move of queen e7, with the idea is takes, takes, and now the queen defends. But unfortunately, uh, move orders in chess, one of the most um, important aspects of calculation, that sometimes if we have an idea and one move order doesn't work out, maybe we can try changing the move order. And But okay, this one is not a simple calculation. But this is another really well-known position, a well-known game. So in this position, white took on h7, and now knight f6. So of course, king cannot go back. We have a checkmate. So the king goes forward, but now the king gets checkmated by force. <coughs> so g3. Um, so there is mate in two. If um, white simply castles, then knight h2 is just unstoppable. But I think the game is actually a lot nicer because bishop e2. So the king actually runs all the way to the g1, king d2, and checkmate. Um, you know, I'm not sure if I've seen... I want to say I've seen both this game with king d2 and castle. I think castle is a better checkmate. It's just cuter to castle and checkmate your opponent. Okay, so this one, this game is of course very old, but uh, just a very classical example of um, this king runs. So another one is by Alexander Alekin. So this against um, Yates. So this is another, like a very classical well-known game. So, so far I think everything we're looking at, um, maybe people are familiar with. But that this one we will play through the game, we will actually focus through some aspects of the game. So d4, e6, e4, knight f3, d5. So d takes c4 is a very trendy move right now. So this is a very <laughs> trendy opening, but uh, hard to imagine this opening becoming trendy without the help of engines, because it's just such an ugly way of playing. Oh no, sorry, not this. I mean, although that, that is also a move. So just playing this is just such a modern way of playing. But instead, bishop g5, castle, rook c1. So we will uh, stop at some key points. So bishop goes here. So it gives up the center. Uh, knight e4. So f5, yeah. So f5 is a bit of a difficult move to play, but... Um, We can see maybe some trouble with this king. Um, although, uh, 
when you play a move like f5, you, um, it's just such a long-term difficult move to play because this, um, the c8 bishop might become a problem. So whenever black gives up the center like this, at some point in this position, at some point black has to get in either c5 or e5, something to fight against this center. Otherwise, if uh, white black just allows white to do everything, just castle, go e4, white just gets the world, and um, <clears throat> what is black even doing? But f5 is a bit um, of a to committal of a move. So of course this has to be taken. And now b5. And I think this is a very interesting point in the game. Because again, if we stop and this mouse. Uh, so if we stop and just um, think about what has happened. So all these moves that uh, Black has made has left him with two backwards pawns, so c6 and e6 pawns. But uh, Black's idea is very clear, right? To play bishop b7 and then get in c5 quickly. So if the bishop goes to d3, can even win this bishop and immediately go c5. Bishop goes here, then yeah, bishop b7 and c5 is rook c8, c5 is coming. So if Black manages to get this, uh, moves in at least, you know, kind of justifies what Black is doing. And uh, the move that White played here, White took, which. Um, which is a good move, but I think can be a difficult move to play because sometimes we have a difficulty giving up our bishop. But if we look at the position, <clears throat> if we look at the position and the structure, because there is a light squared bishop and so many pawns on the light squares, it makes a lot of sense for white to trade everything and leave black with this really bad light squared bishop. And then ideally, if we also, okay, so this was taken. So if we look at a position, it's a good idea to kind of think about, you know, this like long-term thinking of, okay, which pieces do I want to trade, which pieces, which trades I just want to completely avoid. So if we can imagine these two knights coming off the board, then it's, it's just really hard to imagine how this bishop is ever going to become part of the game with this structure. Even if the bishop goes on some kind of a diagonal, it's hard to imagine what it will be doing there because it doesn't, like if um, if I take this knight off the board, if I can visualize that, and even if this bishop somehow ends up on e4, it's not really doing much there. Not that this bishop really has a path of going to a4. So already this position um, strategically becoming quite difficult for black because of these holes in the position, and of course this fight for the c file, the only open file in the position. A move like e5 is uh, is just going to leave too many holes in the position because black will still have this difficult this problematic piece the c8 bishop and in addition they'll also have this d5 weakness so in the game castles a5 is trying to get in something like b5 bishop a6 so knight b3 a4 and knight c5 so white is following up with this plan and trying uh, you know, to exchange these knights and then once these knights are off the board we can imagine this knight landing on e5 and then we get this very classical example of a good knight versus a bad bishop where this e5 knight on the dark square will just completely dominate this light squared bishop and uh, so in this game actually it really feels like black was kind of quite cooperative and allowed white just to kind of get the world but i think it's a, just a very good example when we have this kind of example where one side is just completely dominant because it just demonstrates the idea so well. So everything comes off the board. So b4 and rook fc1. And uh, another problem in this position for black is, again, the trading of the pieces. So of course, <coughs> so of course uh, for black to fight for the c file at some point this bishop has to move and the rook has to go to c8 but black has to think about what will happen if all the pieces come off the board so if we make a couple more moves knight e5 and we already see that the rook c8 runs into a lot of problems because if we trade everything simply knight d3 and at least one pawn will fall and then black is going to have to defend this difficult endgame down the pawn and the, and the problem is the, 
issues that black had in the position don't go away because after the b4 pawn falls or maybe even the knight goes to c5 and takes this pawn instead because if we take the pawn on a4 instead we're leaving them with the pawn on the dark squares which means the bishop cannot even defend so this pawn might fall immediately uh, so immediately as soon as black tries to fight back and tries to fight for the only open file in the position uh, like bad things happen right like the position just starts to fall apart so instead so already we see that there's huge issues in the position so it becomes a matter of how white is going to try to win this and how white is going to uh, convert this advantage so black plays rook b8 f3 um, of course opening square for the king and now b3 of course there is no reason of taking and opening the file for this rook so a3 and again we see this um, this move will run into this problem and again knight d3 knight goes to c5 and at least one pawn will fall and this is very unfortunate because after the knight goes to c5 hitting both pawns let's say king f7 knight c5 now the bishop doesn't have time to go to square to defend the pawn but even if it did <coughs> the king will just go and take this pawn so the structure is really bad for black so instead black plays h6 white starts bringing the king h4 um, in this kind of structures h4 is a very useful move because once the pawn goes to h5 it will really fix the structure which means the g7 pawn will just stay on g7 forever and uh, this pawn will just never be able to move and there's another target in the position and when it comes to conversion um, top players like strong players are very good at this kind of things just creating more problems for the opponent so rook goes to f8 and now the king is joining the game so attacks the bishop and bishop a6 and ooh. and now rook 5 to c6 so like also hitting this pawn and now king f4 so now the king is joining the game and uh black like now at this point because there's just so many targets in the position so many issues uh, can't really move and cannot really hope for any kind of uh, counterplay because this pawn is hanging this bishop is hanging so which means now the pieces are really limited the rook cannot move the pawn hangs the other rook cannot hang the cannot move the bishop hangs so king goes back pawn to h5 <coughs> so g3 so bishop f1 uh, and this is something i was mentioning before like even if the bishop gets on a diagonal it's very unclear what it's doing so okay like black did manage to develop their bishop so the bishop does go did go to a6 it's on a very long diagonal but unfortunately it's doing absolutely nothing there's nothing important going on in this diagonal so it's just a very useless piece so pawn to g3 goes back rook f7 so at some point um, we have to start making progress here and rook g8 so black's strategy is basically is just kind of you know just sitting there and hoping to somehow hold this position but of course the position um, the game is going to end in a few moves because knight d7 a really nice move threatening knight f6 taking the rook king goes back but nonetheless now knight f6 of course taking is impossible rook h7 is made uh, so instead rook f8 was played but rook f6 and now king e5 so now the king dominates the rook and the rook doesn't really have any squares to go to the rook goes to f8 very simple checkmate uh, so I yeah I really enjoyed this game it's a very classical game and uh, the things that I like about this game is just a complete domination by white so starting with taking on d5 this position then coming and exchanging the knight and then like taking control of the c file and of course finally 
uh, when the king joins the game and this final move of playing king e5 if I can get to the final position nope yeah and then the game ends with this centralization move of king e5 um, okay so let's take a so let's take a look at our next two examples. So the next two examples are kind of related to each other. So the next one will be by, why isn't it working? By Tigran Perlosian. So Tigran Perlosian actually is kind of well known. He's a former world champion. Um, kind of well known for this kind of king walks. So in this position, uh, so again, if we do a summary of the position of what is going on, again, we have this dynamic of knight versus bishop, and we have this knight on b3 <coughs> on the light square and a black bishop on d6 on the dark square. And in the other position, we had a different dynamic of um, of the white knight on e5 and the black bishop on a6, but the, the dynamic is the same. So if we do a summary, so there's not that many pieces left on the board. Uh, so unlike the other game, we have queens on the board. So white, once again, uh, funny enough, is controlling the c-file. And the problem for black is this a5 pawn. So this a5 pawn is just a forever problem because it's a fixed pawn and this knight is just forever attacking it and um, because of this pawn structure this bishop doesn't really have much of a future and uh, it's actually very unfortunate that black has to dedicate a queen and a rook to defending the pawn but as the position stands it's um, it doesn't like really look that terrible because we have to think about again like you have a nice position like when we do a summary on when we do an evaluation of the position, okay, there's a nice position, we have certain kind of advantages, but um, how to take uh, advantage of them. And we also, I don't know if um, this concept of the principle of two weaknesses is a very familiar one. Like if your opponent has one weakness and they can defend it, if they can defend it, then it's possible that you cannot really make progress anymore because there's one weakness and your opponent defends it and that's pretty much it. And we do know that this kind of passive defense where you have a bad position but you're just sitting there and you know and uh, just kind of fighting back and trying not to harm your position and your opponent just cannot make progress this is a way to defend. But the you know the principle of the two weaknesses is trying to make another weakness for your opponent. So instead of just having this one weakness where they can just dedicate all their forces to this weakness and just defend the position, all of a sudden they have two weaknesses. And of course, defending two weaknesses is more difficult, especially if the weaknesses are very far away from each other. So in this position, white plays h4 and black responds with h5 so if we look at the pawn structure it's very symmetrical this pawn structure it's kind of a funny one so for black this makes um, a lot of sense because black has black has a dark squared bishop and they have put all their pawns on light squares so the bishop uh, at least they're not blocking their bishop in <laughs> unlike in the last game where we saw the bishop was locked in by black's own pawns but of course uh, this a5 problem and again in this position we have to think about uh, piece exchanges and what happens if all the pieces come off so if all the heavies come off at least right now if we take all the pieces off uh, it's going to become a matter if it's possible for a black to defend this a5 pawn, which of course it is with a move like bishop c7, and if white will be able to kind of a, do some kind of a breakthrough to bring the king in. Uh, so now because, um, because white has such good control of the position and moves like uh, queen b7 <clears throat> like don't really work out, and um, the rook again cannot move, and to something like bishop bishop b7 like around allowing this rook trade is probably not a good idea because then a, a black will be exchanging a 
defender, which means the a5 pawn will fall. So black kind of has to go back and forth. <coughs> okay, my throat is killing me. So with this h5 pawn, makes a lot of sense for white <coughs> to try to play something like g4. But since the king is there, it's a good idea to bring the king to the other side. So now rook c2. And this is the kind of position where there is no reason to rush for white because it's not like um, if white doesn't hurry or white takes their time, there's going to be a really drastic change in the position because um, the, the pawn structure is not going to change. So that's mean the only change that could happen that would change the nature of the position and otherwise like peace exchanges. but. That also is not going to happen because we know that going into an endgame is problematic for black. So black is just kind of shuffling around, and now it's a good, now it's time for uh, white to bring their king to the other side of the board. So uh, black is just shuffling. So the queen goes to e two. Queen goes to b7. Um, now uh, rook to c1. So we'll just repeat the moves a few times. So f4. And here, actually, um, this g4 move is a huge threat. So playing something like f5 is too difficult of a move to play because um, something like knight c5 will just make things very problematic. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, <laughs> I mean, making this kind of move, moves like f5 is just so difficult. Like, I think even psychologically, even like if like you, you think f5 is the best move in a position, psychologically, this would be such a difficult move to play. Uh, so, but here black actually has um, to prepare for this g4 move, so I, maybe this is a good time to pause and think about uh, what to do. Like g4 is coming, let's say white's next move is going to, g4, g, to be g4, how can black prepare? So how to defend against g4. f5. f5 is, is not, not what we want. No, f5, knight c5. Uh, this position will fall apart. So it's not just stopping g4, it's also thinking about, okay, like g4 is coming, so you cannot like physically stop this pawn from going to g4. So like how can you prepare for it? How can you face it? So you have to think about like what does the pawn going to g4 mean? Like why is this g4 move so bad? Okay, so someone suggested bishop e7, but um, the thing about bishop e7, like, um, why it would really welcome giving up this pawn? Because giving up this pawn just means opening the h file. So when your king is lonely, you know, opening files on your king is uh, actually, it's just going to be game over because now the rook will quickly switch back and uh, the position again will fall apart. Why h6? So king h6 here? Uh, but now next move I'll go queen g And again, like, I'm not even... So let's say you go bishop e7 here, right? Um, like, I'm not scared of playing a move like this because if you take, then I go rook h1. And... Uh, 
Okay, you're getting mated, so you have to go h4, but now I can't even go f5. So now you're just getting attacked from different sides of the board. So first, let's think about why g4 is such a scary move. Uh, if you look at Black's king, Black's king is just completely lonely. So if Black's king comes under attack, there's just no one to defend him. And of, when we're going, when we're playing g4, we're attacking these pawns that are on light squares, right? And Black has a dark square bishop. So this dark square bishop is actually not going to be very useful in defending the king. If I like magically put this, even if I put this bishop on g7 somehow, this bishop would not be much of help because after g4, so whenever I play g4, this exchange is going to happen. And once, let's visualize, like this exchange happens, like automatic next move is just going to be h5. White is just trying to destroy this pawn structure. Just go after this, you know, remove h5 from the board, exchange this pawn, and then go h5 and just open files and start attacking this king. Uh, so that's a, a huge problem for black. So black has to think about So when you're under attack, what are some good ways of um, Defending so one is of course exchanging pieces. Unfortunately, that's impossible because Like we cannot get rid of these rooks if we can just if we could get these rooks off the board right for Black at least they're not getting attacked um, so whenever this g4, hg, queen g4 happens, so the h file opens. But h file opening also can be an opportunity for um, black to defend. So one way that black can, um, so what black should have done in this position. So when the h file opens, we want to be able to play rook h8. But the problem is, if we move this rook right preparing for this g4 h5 then our bishop hangs so so like the way that black pieces are set up is just like things are getting in the way of each other so for example if the king was already like somewhere like g7 so if i like pass the move so actually king g7 is the correct move but just just to show what i mean so let's say something like this happens right so now black is just actually on time because the rook goes on h8 stopping h5 Black does bring another defender to the king side, also at the same time attacking this pawn. And now rook h1 is not possible because this rook hangs. So now all of a sudden, black's position is becoming okay because um, now black is getting some counterplay. So after king g7, of course, black will, well, white will immediately play g4. Takes, takes. And again, a key moment of how to defend because rook h so again h5 is coming allowing h5 and hg i hope this part is very uh clear that allowing this is just game over is just uh very terrible at, at the very least this is just <laughs> very bad uh so what can we do to if h5 is coming get some active counterplay or just prevent h5 altogether so block to move what can black possibly do here So rook h8 is not a move. What else can we do here? Uh, rook g8 is not possible because this bishop is hanging. So the d8 rook just cannot move. And this was one of the problems from the very beginning when we set up this position is black movement for black is just difficult. It's like difficult to just find moves that like don't hang pieces. Which is why when white was doing this whole thing of running the king over and like preparing this g4 push with f4 coming bring the queen back all black was doing was shuffling back and forth with the king because other moves were not really possible. So what? Um, so rook h8 is not possible. So, 
Yeah, rook a6 is uh, the defensive move in this position because the king is so lonely, black has to find a way to bring uh, the defensive resources towards the king. So of course the best one would be the queen. So if we could transport this queen to f5, this would solve black's problems on the king side. And so if the rooks are exchanged, now there's really active counterplay because the queen goes to d3, defends g6. And also at the same time now this e3 pawn is hanging, so the position start to get starts to get messy. And if not, <coughs> uh, let's say, wait, and if the rook moves back, again preparing h5, now the rook goes to h8. And if preparing this, the rook goes to h5. And now we can offer a trade of pieces and maybe even something like queen h8 or like bishop e7 now the bishop maybe can go to f6 so now again there's some counterplay for black actually quite a bit of counterplay because now there's targets in white's position so the position changes drastically and the whole uh the reason that this rook a6 worked in this position is because before the queen was on e2 so this rook a6 was just never a possibility but now that the queen's uh, switched to the other side of the board, now rook a6 and exchanging pieces. Because when you attack and you exchange pieces, you're getting rid of your opponent's attackers, and usually your pieces are the defenders. So that's uh, normally a very good trade. But instead, after queen e2, um, black played queen b7, but now g4. And h takes g4. And now h5. So black did manage to bring the queen to the other side of the board, but they did allow this h5 move. And um, it's just not getting uh, to the other side of the board as efficiently, because in the other position that we saw, the rooks came off. So in the other position, the queen was already on d3. Um, I'm not like super... Not super used to leeches, so I have to find my way around. Yeah, in this position. So in this position, a pair of rooks comes off and the queen gets to d3. Like again, the queen. Like the thing is like if h5, check. Um, I can like maybe even consider like taking on e3 and bringing the rook from this side. Like the position like starts to get messy and whenever you have a position where you're suffering and you know your opponent is putting pressure on you then messy is normally a good sign so that means you know uh, at least that you have a chance but in this if we compare positions that after queen b7 h5 uh, white still has complete control of the position of the c file and um, if we compare the rooks, right, like this, these rooks were off the board, but now uh, white still has the pair of rooks. So white plays king a2, avoiding uh, queen f5 queen trade, king g7. And um, in, in this position, because the king is already so weak, there is no reason to trade queens, even though, again, like if we think about the end game, the end game can be very good for white because this a5 pawn but now there's a different element in the position which is this super weak king so now white can just simply attack uh, attack black's king and uh, go for checkmate and if we compare kings look how look how comfortable the king is on a2 and imagine if white rushed with their plan of playing g4 and f4 and all of this and the king was still on the king side so the king would be getting in the way of things maybe running into some kind of um, pins and having to trade queens but now the king on a2 is just completely on the other side of the board it's like if you look at this position you would think the king's are castled on the other side of the board and the king is just completely safe so the queen goes to h4 a tempo move should be seven and now queen back so huge threat of g1 so now white is switching sides and playing on the king side so the king goes back and now the knight comes back and uh, this is a move that i really like 
Um, I really enjoy this kind of maneuvers when a piece is on one side of the board, it's doing something and you know it's been causing some problems for the opponent and at some point the player realizes okay now my piece would be doing a better job on the other side of the board and then they start this maneuver like this is something um, I really enjoy seeing in games. And of course the knight is he headed to e5 and once the knight um, is headed there then it lands there then would be huge problems. So of course black responds with rook b7. So stopping this idea because all of a sudden there's trouble for um, there's going to be trouble for white. White is actually getting made it here. So the knight goes back and now rook c8. And um, the problem is uh, trading is not possible because this is just queen h8 mate. And oops, sorry, if the king goes the other way, um, there's a lot of ways of uh, winning this position. I think f5 is quite convincing, followed with rook e8. This rook is actually, I mean, okay, it's not trapped, but I mean, this is kind of a funny checkmate. So rook goes to d7 and now knight c5. So now tactically the position is just falling apart. Um, which is not surprising whenever one side is dominating, all their pieces are in good squares and you know once you've done the work of putting all your pieces on good squares, your position is also good and you know you have some kind of an advantage. It's not surprising that tactics will solve, uh, there'll be like a tactical solution to the position. So now knight d7, huge threat. So rook c8 loses material of course because and then take here. So b3 is played. Uh, black is trying to tactically get out of this, but now king takes. And f5. So the whole point of uh, playing this move of this uh, b3 is to face this f5 move because now d6 is hanging with check. So rook b6. And now resigns again because the queen is hanging and this just runs into knight knight d7 and then taking on b6. So uh, white was just completely dominating this um, game even though like even though we saw that even in this position uh, black still had the defensive resources it's not like um, unlike in the last game white's domination wasn't as extensive black still had the, this king g7 move still keeps the game going there's like um, nothing too terrible in black's position but when you do come under this kind of pressure, it's very common to just collapse and either um, not really foresee how scary your opponent's threats are or just like kind of miss something because you're just constantly under, under pressure. And then once we got to this position, we saw that once this um, king opened up, then white, uh, black did manage to bring a defensive resource to the king. But the problem is white is also bringing more attackers. So once white played queen h4 here, the rook goes to g1. So now white has two attackers with these rooks and with the queen, but black still doesn't have too many defenders. So now there's just uh, too many weaknesses in black's position. So this king is weak. And again, in the long term, even though it didn't come to this, this a5 pawn is still a huge weakness. So we said that actually, the king tries to run away, but now white comes from both sides, right? This queen is threatening from this side. There's rook one to c8, and um, black just wasn't able to handle everything. And our final example will be um, Wang Hao versus um, Levan Aronian. It's actually um, it's a nice example, like Taiwan showed it to me, I um, can't remember why, <laughs> but he was talking about this and I was like, wow, this is so brilliant. And this is um, more of a preventative way of playing. I'm going to take a sip of my water. So if we do... Um, Summary of the position. 
So white has more space, right? Because of this pawn structure, the pawn on d4, more active than these two pawns. We have opposite color bishops, and opposite color bishop positions are very interesting when it's not a just opposite color bishop endgame, they're really drawn. When we add more pieces on the board, uh, they're really great for attacking because if I'm a if white starts to somehow attack on the light squares, then black just has no defense because the dark square bishop cannot defend. So if we took this bishop and put it on b1, there'd be like huge problems in uh, black's position because what is the e7 bishop going to do against this? Uh, so this structure um, can, can have some long-term problems for black. So if you look at the, what's going on, so the queen on b4 is actually quite nicely placed. It's controlling um, the dark squares on the queen side. So the queen is not really free to move. This pawn start to hang. So there are some um, weaknesses in white's position. This g3 pawn, this e3 pawn. So it's not like white can do whatever they want. So pushing this e4 pawn, um, something, you know, an ideal world white maybe wants to do, but it just leaves this d4 pawn really weak. So there's a dark square bishop. So we see this pawn structure of all the dark squares and light square bishop, and then we see this pawns on light squares, so limiting the opponent's bishop. So all of this makes a lot of sense. So what we have to look at is this pawn structure here, and this h5 pawn. And we get this kind of structures uh, from Karl Kahn, if you're familiar with e4, c6, d4, d5, knight, c3, that line with uh, bishop f5. We get this kind of structure where white castles on the opposite side and because there is a hook in the position like g4 g5 is very scary so the thing about this position again very similar to what we saw before uh, white has a very clear idea and uh, black doesn't really have one because playing something like c5 leaves um, them really vulnerable and like okay c5 is not really possible now but like in the future trying to do this uh, so black has to think about how to face this potential of g4, g5. So it's actually not really possible or advisable for this king to run to the queen side. So actually it's hard to imagine how this would even happen with the queen on b4. So because, but because black's pieces are, um, especially the queen, right, on this side of the board, and the position is quite locked in with this pawn structure. So for example, the, um, we can imagine the king goes to g2, g4, rook g1, g5, and then again starting opening up this queen side. And whenever uh, we're playing on the flank, it's a matter of having control of the center. So if the center doesn't open, if you're playing on a flank, like you're up pushing pawns, you have to make sure the center doesn't open because that's how your king side collapses. That's how you get in trouble. Uh, but because white does have this really nice grip on the center, like this long-term plan is actually quite scary for black. So in this position, king g2 was played, rook a d8, queen c4, and um, so trading, um, I don't think this is something he wanted to do, uh, because, um, I think if the bishop goes to b5, maybe something like c5, and the bishop might get stuck here. But in this position, and I remember Levon was showing this, and he was talking about it, he was like, oh, I realized that like this g4, g5 is coming, and this is a problematic thing. So he decides to start running away with the king. So bishop e4, and he just runs. Because he knows something is going to happen on the king side, and he doesn't want his king to be there. And of course, it's quite risky uh, for white if the black king runs to the queen side to start pushing pawns on the king side because it's, uh, like he's only taking risks with his own king because the other king will be on the other side of the board. I did not mean to do that. So rook c7, and he has cleared the path for his king to run. So g4, queen b6, and now the queen goes, king goes to d7, and now king goes to c8. Uh, so in this position, they just kind of shuffled back and forth because I think uh, Wan Hao realized that this whole expedition of playing rook g1 and rook g, uh, pawn to g5 is just too risky because at some point black will be able to play c5 and the c file will open and like the king will just become too vulnerable. So they just played bishop c4 and they just 
shuffled back and forth and the game ended in a draw. Uh, but um, so like the examples that we've seen is the king, like we saw how the king just marches and dominates the board. But I think this is such a nice example of the like foreseeing the danger and for so far from far away too and just running to the other side of the board. Yeah. In which position? Go Let back me go back. Like, is it possible to somehow leave the queen on c2 to prevent the king loss? Like, it doesn't look like black can do anything in the meantime. Um, but is... all right. So, like in this position, instead of that, uh, let's say if you go g4. g4. If we're in this position immediately, I think I might be able to play like c5 even. This is safe. That uh, okay. Yeah, but okay, like even if I go here, maybe my moves are not ideal. Like I put a bishop on f6. Yeah, now if. Okay, but uh, okay, you can come back. I don't think this is such a huge deal. Okay, but if you come back here and then like I'm able to play this, this actually will become problematic. Yeah, I mean the thing about this position, like um, g4, g5 is like the only idea for white to do some kind of a breakthrough. So it either works or it doesn't. And like to do it when your own king is there, like it's, um, and the king is not there, it's kind of risky. Like in this position, I think the way they would do it, he would go like g4, maybe king h3, and then rook g1, and then play g5, something like this. But it does look good here if you start to see a drop to the white. Uh, yeah, even with the queens off, though, like the only. It's just gonna be pressure on black's position. I mean, again, you're playing kind of, uh, you know, you're just defending against your opponent's plan, and you don't really have a plan of your own. But like, I mean, I like this is one of like, I, I think like obviously if your opponent has a very clear threat, right, I'm going to be like um, sacrificing something or doubling my rooks and checkmating. It's like a very easy idea to see and to stop, but like to foresee this like g4, g5 and you're like, oh, this is going to be annoying and this is not something I want to deal with. And to use a king march as a preventative method, I thought it was just like such a unique example of just running away from all the problems in the position and then all of a sudden your king is just on the other side of the board and your king is the one that's fine and now g5 is just not even something you ever have to worry about because it just carries so many risks for black or white not for black okay this was it for me um this was you know we had five examples of king marches um actually at some point i was just searching I was also read through, I, I really like this Yasser book, he co-wrote it, I forgot with who, but he has like, they have like different chapters of like, in the end game, when you're on the winning side, when you're on the losing side, and then as, uh, at some point like Levon showed me the, this position, and uh, like I, I started making a database of king runs, and like, I don't know how I even came across from them. I also had like one Firuja game where the king just runs on the opposite side of the board, just like takes all of the opponent's pawns. There's also uh, one very famous one by David Navarro, I think, or Duda. I don't think it's like a middle game, and then, or like at least a queenless end game, and the king is just in some crazy line, just runs and uh, doesn't get made it somehow. But yeah, this is um, a topic I actually enjoy because I think it's such an enjoyable concept, and you know, if you get to do this in the game, it just feels really good. The chances that I've had in my games, I've missed them, unfortunately, but um, I think a nice thing to keep in mind. Ooh, I clicked on something. All right, so that was it for me today.